Welcome to Cybility Savvy, the show that demystifies cybersecurity for not for profit boards and leaders. Hello, I'm your host, Michaela Leoborg, and today we're going to be talking with Laura Dawson, the CIO, about her journey to becoming a cyber savvy executive. We'll discuss the ins and outs of cybersecurity in the higher education sector from the perspectives of both employee and trustee. Our guest today is Laura Dawson. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Michaela. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're most welcome. I think this could be a really interesting uh, show for people to listen to. I hope so. I very much hope so. So for those in the audience who might be listening today that don't know who you are, would you like to please just tell us a bit about yourself first? My name's Laura Dawson. I'm the Chief Information Officer at the London School of Economics. I've been there for about four years. Uh, I've spent most of my working career working with technology and I started leading technology teams way back in 1989, in fact. So mm -hmm. I've been leading teams for quite a long time and I've seen a lot of changes in uh, technology and particularly cybersecurity, which I'm sure we'll touch upon. I think it's also particularly interesting that, you know, as a woman, you were in a leadership position in technology so early. I, I guess, I mean, it was a bit of a surprise. I was I was very, very lucky. I mean, I should say, first off the bat, I am one of Thatcher's YTSers. So I went to a Highland Eye Tech and I studied computers on the BBC Bs. I did coding mm -hmm. on BBC Bs and Commodore Pets, for those of you old enough to remember what those are. And I actually applied to join, well, I first, I first moved to Edinburgh and worked in an accountant's office, but I applied to join the civil service. And I did okay. what was called the automatic data processing aptitude test. Right. Which got me into the Ministry of Defence. And then they had this thing in the civil service then where all the jobs were advertised in all mm -hmm. the departments. And I applied for a role in a little tiny organisation called Government Actuaries Department. Right. And um, I got the job because I'd written a how to use computers guide in the Ministry of Defence and they were just blown away with the how to use computers guide. Um, so, yes, I got the job there and I was leading a team of, of three at the time. It's really interesting to me about, you know, the path you've taken. Uh, could you tell us a bit about how you went from sort of the Ministry of Defence into um, higher education? Yeah, it's, it's quite a journey, actually. I mean, obviously, it's quite a long period of time. I was in, in the Ministry of Defence, 1986 was when I started there. I think main, mainly the focus and the theme of it has always been technology. And I've been looking for jobs um, that allowed me to do different things in terms of technology. And so I spent about 16 years working in various government departments. I worked, uh, as I said, government actuaries department, which was great. Mm -hmm. Big data. And I mean, really big and personal data. So you're talking about pensions, mm -hmm. things like that. So lots and lots of data, lots and lots of sensitivity around it. The mm -hmm. very early days of computing and then moving through sort of Oftel. And, and, and then I, I had a stint in an arts organization for the government. And I found that that was that was interesting. It was a bit more values based than what I'd mm -hmm. been in before. And so I started to kind of understand more about social impact, all of those kinds of things. They were doing a lot of work with children and art. Mm -hmm. um, they were doing quite a lot of work with University of Bristol on um, using technology to assist children in learning. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of cutting edge type stuff. I mean, this was in 2002 to 2006. And then uh, there was a role came up at um, the RSPB, which... I'd always been a bit, I mean, I came from a farm, I like nature. I applied and I got the role. And I think that was when I realized that actually, I really quite like the charity sector. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard in the charity sector for two really big reasons. One, when you're talking about cybersecurity, the culture in charities can often be, no one's going to hurt us because we're nice. And, and that's just not true. And it's quite hard to deal with that. And then the second thing in charities is they don't have a lot of wherewithal. They don't have mm. oodles of cash. Even the big ones are very conscious of their budgets. Every penny spent is a penny not spent on children, yeah. that kind of thing, or a penny not spent on nature. And that is always at the forefront of your mind. So you're always trying to squeeze a quart out of a pint pot. But the relationship with people that you had is just deeper and richer and more mm. values based. You know, I, I can remember going to a bird reserve and I knew nothing about birds. I mean, apart from an oyster catcher, I could probably spot one of them and a robin. Mm. 
was rubbish at birds. And I remember being shown my first snipe and it's kind of like, <gasps> wow. And I was just so excited. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, that, that helped. And then I kind of went from a number of different, went through a number of different charities. I jokingly say I've done nature, I've done animals, children, world peace, and now education. <laughs> nice. I kicked them off. <laughs> but it is a, I, I mean, education has always been something. I mean, I, I kind of naively maybe think education is a major benefit and, and solution to many of the problems in the world. The more we can know about mm-hmm. each other, and about how things work, the better we will be. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that, absolutely. Here you are then, higher education, and you've taken the role of CIO. At what point did you realise you were responsible for cybersecurity? Um, actually, right from the outset. Okay. Right from the outset. And I've been, I mean, I've, I've, I've been on a bit of a journey with cybersecurity. But when I arrived, I had what was my executive team, so I had five, mm. five direct reports, and then I had another four people who reported to me, but they weren't in the executive team, one of which was the security, head of security. OK. So the first thing I did was I lifted everybody up. So it's like, I'm not having this. I'm not going to have like, you know, a dog leg. I mean, that's yeah. just nuts. Let's, just, let's not do that. So I lifted that. And then I went through a restructure of the team and basically went down to four direct reports, one of which was the head of, of cybersecurity, who's now my director of cybersecurity. And so I've always been very aware and conscious that cybersecurity is, is part of my remit. And it's also part of my remit in two ways. So one is the kind of role that he has, which is this sort of assurance role, mm-hmm. second line of defense role. But then I also have the first line of defense role, which is the operation. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of keep those two as separate as I can, but they're really important that they're connected together as well. So, so yeah, right from the outset and, and I realized that I didn't have what I needed in terms of strength. He had the right person. He didn't necessarily have the right authority in the team. Yeah, I think that's very common uh, across the board, actually. Uh, quite often, you know, uh, security expected to sort of you know, do everything, be accountable, even though they shouldn't be. And uh, because they don't have the authority to actually make things happen quite a lot of the time. So you do end this sort of conflict. But I'm quite interested in what you just said about you've got two roles, you know, the mm. sort of cybersecurity and you know, the operations. What about a third role in terms of you being the face of cybersecurity? to the execs your fellow execs and sort of you know banging that drum and supporting do you consider that perhaps a third role or I do I do um I just happen to think personally Mm -hmm. that my director of cyber security is actually way better at it than I am Mm -hmm. I absolutely Mm -hmm. do that but I think he has got I'm very blessed actually he's got such a good way of delivering a message that I I mean I set him up um, I mean, I come do the introduction things. Hello, this is this is my cybersecurity person. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is perfectly capable of delivering that message with the level of authority that he needs. And with with the way that we're working at the moment, he does get to do that looming down the camera of people, which which really works quite well. <laughs> um, what I don't want to do is water down his message in no. any way. In fact, his mm-hmm. message has to be absolutely crystal clear mm-hmm. and not adulterated by me in any way. Mm-hmm. So I have to do that. But equally, I also have to translate sometimes and to do things in a slightly different way. And, my, and, you know, we have conversations about bringing context into the conversation and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. So is that very much sort of what you see your role as, you know, being that sort of translate between uh, the two sides if needed? If needed, but rarely is it needed. And as I said mm-hmm. at the beginning, I think he is just perfect. And he's, he's also that bit more, and this is going to sound a bit weird, he's actually that bit more empathetic. Mm-hmm. to the needs of the individuals that he's having those conversations so I will have no qualms about sending him in to have a conversation with someone who's in a really difficult position mm-hmm. something bad has happened and he needs to have a conversation I will have no qualms about her letting him do that because he will just do it so much more empathetically but also mm-hmm. clearly than I could ever do because he mm-hmm. knows the subject so well yeah I think there's definitely um, a school of uh, InfoSet pros who are sort of like that in terms of I was maybe I'm stereotyping too much the sort of old school and new school the old yeah. school being the sort of you know security says no the new school being you know well yes how can we help you do that securely and as you say be empathetic and understand the business needs etc or in your case the educational needs you mentioned as well the importance of authority there was it simply lifting them up that gave the authority or were there other things that you did to, that you can identify that really supported them in uh, helping them with that? 
well, probably the number one thing that I have to do is sponsorship. I have a very clear view about what I mean by that. You get, you get a lot of, I remember having lots of conversations with people about, oh, this person needs a coach or this person needs a mentor. I don't agree with that because what you're saying when you say this person needs a coach or a mentor is there's something wrong with that person and they need help mm-hmm. to be better. There is nothing wrong with the individual that I'm talking about here. They don't need somebody to tell them how to do it. Mm-hmm. What they need is for me to open doors for them. And yes. that's what I mean by sponsorship. So my job is to do things like, OK, with that particular issue, you know, you need to speak to this person or I'm sitting in a board meeting and there's a conversation going on. and say, well, actually, why don't we get Jethro in here to discuss this with us? Because actually this is his area of expertise. And mm-hmm. that's what I mean about sponsorship. I mean, it applies mm-hmm. to anyone in my team, but particularly around about cybersecurity. And then there is and I'm, I'm not always as good at this because you can imagine what I'm like. I'm a bit full on. The other thing that I have to do is to step back and give them the space. Now, right. that for me is a huge stretch mm-hmm. because you walk into a room and I just want to fill a room. <laughs> but I need to step back and give him the space and let him say what he needs to be able to say. And that's about giving him the floor. Right. Letting him have that conversation. And it comes to it's, it's little things. I had a, a boss who always insisted on doing a long preamble when they were introducing me to, to speak. So I was coming to a board meeting or something. There'd be a long preamble about that. And it was all utter rubbish. Not here, I used mm-hmm. to say. It was all utter rubbish. But what it did was it just minimised me. Right. Oh gosh. It was, it was minimising. And so I have to make sure that if I'm, you know, there's no point in me doing a long preamble when I'm about to introduce somebody else to come and speak at a board meeting or in a, mm. in a committee meeting or whatever it is we're doing. I just need to say, no, I'm just going to hand over to Jethro. Jethro, do you want to introduce yourself? And then you can take off from there. Mm. That's all you need to do. You don't need to do anything else. And so it's giving people the space. Be generous with your time, obviously, but equally be aware when you don't want to overdo it. I mean, the other thing about it is it's very easy to give him the authority he needs to do and for him to take it because I trust him so much. I mean, right. he, is, he is somebody who is just able to do the job really, really, really well. And I know he is. So mm. I, it's dead easy for me to, to give him the authority he needs to do the job. And how would you say um, the organisation sort of responded uh, to that change? Because obviously, you know, they were there before and suddenly, you know, here they are and you'll be more vocal opening these doors. How's the organisation's sort of culture to handle that, if you like? Well, I think, I mean, we've had some successes, which has helped. Well, the fir- first of all, he always had a good reputation with particular parts of the school. So he deals a lot with things like the NHS toolkit. So he's he's done, he's always done that. And so he's always had a really good relationship with the researchers of the school who are involved in those kinds of things. So he's, 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 he's already got that kind of baseline. Well, we can see they've responded really, really well because they've given us the money we need to do the work we need to do. So that's always a bit of a win. I mean, being in a university, we're probably in a really kind of quite privileged place compared to some of the other not-for-profits. But I think it, it, it does help. The other thing that really, really helped is that when I first started, so my first year, we had a ridiculous number of phishing attempts. And mm. as a result, a fairly ridiculous number of compromised accounts. And it's, it kind of happens twice a year with students. Mm. It happens at Christmas time and it happens at the start of academic year. Christmas time, because people are sending ridiculous pictures of kittens about with hats <laughs> on and people click them. I mean, who doesn't like a cat? But then you also get at the start of academic year, you get um, loads, loads of emails coming to students telling them, click this, click that. So, of course, it's really hard to, for them to differentiate. So we had this ridiculous number of phishing attempts and we, we sort of very quickly put some mechanisms in place to get that down. And the following year, we went from ridiculous numbers, which I'm not going to tell you, but was ridiculous numbers. It, was, it had knots in it to two. At Christmas. That's amazing. And it was incredible. And and my director was able, the director of the school was able to say that in a um, school wide meeting. So she mm. said it out loud and it, it basically just opened doors for us having right. a success of that kind because it had been bad. And I think the, the other thing about it was as well is that when we had the really bad time, I came in, I had a very different style on alerting the school and when bad things were happening. My number one tip to anyone is if something bad is happening, tell everybody, you know, don't don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Just learn how to write. I need to inform you this is underway. We're investigating. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to you at 11 o'clock and let you know what the update is. That's all you have to do. But you have to tell people. 
And so that's what I was doing. So they all knew we'd had this really terrible situation with compromised accounts and phishing attempts. And they also knew how we handled it, which made a big difference, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point there because, you know, we're in security. It's so, you know, sort of working, beavering away in the background. And most of the time, you know, people have got no idea what you're doing, what's going on, what you're sort of against. And they only hear about you when something goes wrong. So make the most of that as an opportunity uh, to show the value of your team, I think. Yeah. And I get, I mean, in in a previous job, um, we also set up this thing, and I'm quite keen to consider doing it here, where we sent out security alerts that weren't just to do with the office. Yeah. So there, I think it was at the time there was um there were some bank frauds going on and bank account stuff. We had this process of sending out security alerts mm. and it just said title what you need to know, why you need to know it. And then at the bottom it said we don't send you anything that you don't need to know. And those that kind of made it a bit more what's in it for me to read them. Some things like the I love you bug, or, you know, and if anything hit the press as being a virus that people at home were attacked, we would send out a security alert saying this is what you need to do. And that just made a bit of warmth towards the security team that mm-hmm. actually, you know, you want them, not only have they got our backs for work, but they've got our, ba- our backs for life too. That's quite cool. That's a cool message. It absolutely is. Um, and actually on that topic, where I used to work recently, the uh, head of learning, the development did say to me after going through the sort of new version of uh, the e-learning course for cybersecurity, which was bite size sort of things together. These are really life skills, aren't they? I was like, yes, yes, they are. <laughs> Ping. <laughs> yeah, so if only we, it's so easy to sort of get more people uh, realising that. And I think well, slowly we are perhaps, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. In terms of, you know, again, here you are, CIO, with your team, uh, new sector, what would you say was one of the sort of biggest sort of surprises to you about that shift? Well, coming into higher education, mm. I guess it was the students actually. And I, and I guess it's kind of like you had an assumption, and we, we've always got this assumption that the, the generation coming up and the next one and the next one and the next one are more security savvy than, or more technically savvy than you were. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a digital immigrant, definitely. I'm not a digital native. But what I discovered and, and what was a surprise to me was was how lacking in cyber savvy they were. And maybe that's something that again it's for, for life as well as for the work environment, is that not everybody who knows how to use an iPad or an iPhone really, really well understands the importance of their own data. And that I think was a was a bit of a surprise. I guess the other thing that surprised me is Everywhere I've gone, whether it was government, or private sector to government, to charity, to higher education, it mm. feels like I've gone back in time in every move. <laughs> so it's kind of like a government is 10 years behind um, private sector and charity is 10 years behind government. I wouldn't say that now. Actually, mm. I think I think charities have outstripped government quite a lot. But then higher education is behind charity. Oh, and, and mostly it's behind it on applications and operations. So it's our operational side of things and how much we've automated that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suspect part of it is to do with the selling software into the higher education sector. It's actually really difficult because there isn't a kind of one size fits all approach. And in fact, if anything, higher education hates the concept of one size fits all and refers to it as one size fits no one. There's a real lack of technology in particular areas around about operations. Mm-hmm. that would make us more efficient and more effective and less vulnerable mm-hmm. so every, everything's kind of I mean the most horrific thing was finding out just how bespoke everything was we've coded our way out of every single bad process problem we've got rather than than looking at design of pro- processes and it's a bit of a horrific story I guess um, and it's very it's it's difficult to get out of mm. But that adds huge amounts of vulnerability. Every single connection to every other lot. That's a, that's a hole and, and someone can mm-hmm. get in that hole. Yeah. And how do you sleep at night knowing that? You have to, actually. I had a boss once said to me, it's just a job to be done. Whilst I'm very passionate about what I do, I also have that in my head. It's a job to be done. Do what you can. Do the best you can. And I say that to everybody. Do what you can. Do the best you can. But go and get some sleep and go and live because those are important too. What would you say are the traits that make a good CIO uh, and that enables them to work effectively 
with security and vice versa, perhaps. The number one thing is being, and, and I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but to be confident about your own abilities. If you are insecure about your abilities or you're insecure about the work that you've got to do, you're at risk of hiding things. You're at risk of that little that little voice behind you going, they're out to get you or whatever it is that, that mm-hmm. you've got in your little voice, that will stop you from doing what you need to do because you have to be open and transparent um, and build trust. And you can't do that if you lack confidence. I mean, again, somebody once said to me some, when I, I, I got a job and I was kind of going, oh my God, I can't believe they've chosen me, blah, 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 blah. And they went, no, they did choose you. They chose you. That, that means something. Remember that. Mm-hmm. And that I think people kind of need to get that into their heads. Then they go for a job is that they were chosen mm-hmm. for a reason. So, so a little bit of confidence. I think that's quite important. Mm-hmm. I, I touched upon openness and transparency. You have to be open. You have to be transparent. You have to be brave. Mm-hmm. So you have to have that conversation with people that says, actually, something has gone wrong. We don't know exactly what it is. We're investigating it. You know, people will forgive you if you communicate. They won't yeah. forgive you if you don't. So so that's quite a, quite important. And then the other bit is around about the communication is just remember that nature abhors a vacuum. If you don't say something, people will mm-hmm. think you're a bad person and you're up to mm-hmm. something and you're, you're hiding it from them, mm-hmm. which is awful in a security sphere because sometimes you can't tell them. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's something around the sort of marketing, I guess, that, that sort of, you know, on LinkedIn, we talk about personal branding and everything. But I guess it's the same sort of thing here around security and the branding with the organization yeah it is I remember having a conversation with my boss about something completely different actually about he was saying I just need to get through this meeting I go well no actually what do you want to get out of that what's the message you want to get out of that meeting what do you want to want them to feel and that's kind of what you have to do with cyber security yeah we 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 actually genuinely do have to scare people sometimes Mm -hmm. to get movement and get traction so sometimes you want that brand to be clear authoritative but actually pretty brutal to get something across if you need to. But you also need to be empathetic as well and understand context. So yeah, I think branding, the brand that you want, what is the message you want people to take away about what you're saying? is worth thinking about that up front. Excellent. So is there anything else you'd sort of like to share with our listeners um, around your role as a CIO and cybersecurity? I did want to touch upon something that we talked about separately, which was around about the conflict of interest, because Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting situation. Should the CISO or the director of cybersecurity report to the CIO? Mm -hmm. And my kind of view on this is, and you're not going to like this, is it depends. Context really, really, really matters. And, and interestingly, I, I got into trouble with my team here actually a little while ago, um, because when I did the restructure in the restructure mm-hmm. document, I said that at some point the cybersecurity team mm-hmm. needs to come out from under the CIO and go and move to. We've got a thing called the school secretary. OK, it's, that is the governance. Function. The corporate governance. Yeah. yeah. So the team, they saw this in the paper and they were really upset because they mm-hmm. didn't want to move from out nice. underneath the CIO and that's not I'm not a brilliant person or anything like that it's not that it was that they could see a roadmap they could see the path and they could see that they what they needed to do but you contrast that with my job before this Mm -hmm. and the CISO there was determined to not work for the CIO and your CIO I mean me then so my previous was absolutely determined they were definitely going to work for me (laughs) <laughs> so you have a bit of a journey and that that was clearly that was never going to really work things changed and it got a lot better mm-hmm. I would I would say at that point that thing I said about insecurity mm-hmm. I was probably a bit more insecure than I am now okay and that insecurity kind of went oh I can't let them go they have to report to me that surely that they're, 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 you know and you get that kind of behavior mm-hmm. I think context matters and I've met some CIOs where absolutely the director of security or whatever you want to call them should not report to them Mm. because they're just going to dampen down the message the whole time the model that i would always go back to and always use is the three lines of defense model Mm. i have that role of i am responsible and accountable for the operation my director of cybersecurity sits on the side pokes me and goes you need to be doing this laura you need to be doing this so yeah i wanted to just touch on that that conflict of interest it can be there but you've kind of got to be mature yeah and confident and realize that it's not about you 
so in terms of you know this, this reporting i just say it depends and actually you know i agree with you it always does depend very much on the context i think I, i've seen sort of some CISOs reporting to CIOs it works and some it doesn't um reporting to the CFO is quite common and Ouch. yeah no it's interesting you reacted that way because for most people it's a oh ouch and then for others they actually manage to make it work mm. because they're able to translate cyber security risks uh, into sort of a, a financial impact uh, which then helps the CFO support them in the investment. There's no getting away from it. It all comes down to personality and confidence. So I've worked for some CFOs who their main thing is all about reducing cost, reducing cost, reducing cost. That was that was always in it. And they didn't really understand the value of investment in something that was to do with risk. Maybe that is the kind of key skill, is the ability to assess risk. And if you've got a CISO, and I've had CISOs work for me who are like this, where the chances of anything happening are either half, either it will or it won't, or it's a dead certainty, this bad thing is going to happen. And you kind of go, really? And if you've got that kind of almost um, binary approach to security, Mm -hmm. then that's going to push away people. And, you know, so it does depend on both. And I think in those circumstances, you definitely need somebody like a CIO over them Mm -hmm. to help them to say, Okay, okay, that risk isn't really going to be 100%, is it? Let's just work it through together as to where we're going to be. Mm-hmm. The CFO, if they've not got a really good, strong understanding of, of risk, that could be a problem. I think we're violently agreeing, aren't we? I, I do think we might be, yes. <laughs> Excellent. The conversation with Laura was so good that we didn't want you to miss anything. So we split the episode into two parts. Join us next week when Laura will talk about her role as a trustee. Mm-hmm.